Thanks, Helena. Thanks, Gord. Especially, you know, the SFU programs, I'm a huge fan, so it's a real treat to be a part of it tonight. Thanks to TransLink, who've been, in my opinion, quite brave in putting this series on. Now, I want to start with two little participatory exercises. One is, um, if you work for TransLink, please put up your hand. <laughs> Way high, really high, and keep it high. Now, if anybody's been paying attention to the news lately, you'll know that TransLink is the dog we love to kick. We love, the institution we love to blame for our own inability to make decisions. Even as we cut their funding, they continue to work hard for the benefit of, of the region. So could I please get those hands up again? Please. <laughs> and if you are sitting next to one of these people, I would like you to reach over and give them a gentle hug and thank you. <laughs> I'm watching you. If you don't do it, you're in trouble. OK, handshakes are good enough. OK, John Helliwell would be proud of you. OK, so the, the second exercise is this. Take a look at these two pictures. These are two dorms at Harvard University. Which one of these do you think would make you happier if you had to live there for three years? Would, could somebody, uh, um, let's see a show of hands for Lowell House on the left. Who would be happier in Lowell House? OK, sure. Uh, a show of hands for brutalist Mather House over on the right. Interesting. Um, well, hold on to those answers for a second. So Elizabeth Dunn, who's now a psychologist at UBC, actually polled students at Harvard, because she had gone through this herself, about where they would be happier. Because after one year at Harvard, you get pushed into a residence. You don't know where you're going to go. At least this is the way it used to be. And the students who got elected to Lowell House jumped for joy. And those who got sent to Mather cried. <laughs> but working under uh, the great psychologist Dan Gilbert, Liz actually polled these students for the next three years on their subjective well-being, their happiness with their entire life. And what she discovered was that the students were wrong. It's not that Mather House was any happier. It's that they were both kind of equally happy. And that there are many factors influencing happiness in our lives, in our cities. And what these students didn't realize was it was actually the social environment in each house that determined their happiness. Mather House, they had these amazing soap foam parties. It, they actually sound quite disgusting to me. But <laughs> this contributed to the social environment. So I raise this story because I think perhaps we all would have been surprised by this result. Certainly the students were. And it tells us a truth about how we make decisions and how we make decisions in cities today. So we all make decisions about how to live in cities, how to build cities, based on an idea of happiness. Economists like to call this an attempt to maximize utility. And we get it wrong over and over. So it's important to consider that. And I'll come back to that point uh, later in the hour. Now I want to make another point here, which is that I think that happiness is a good thing. I agree with Aristotle. It's a good thing to pursue, and it's a good thing for policymakers to pursue on behalf of society compared to other measures. So if you don't agree with me, we can meet at the Charles Bar afterwards and have a little fight about this. But I've got, uh, I've got neuroscientists, uh, behavioral economists, psychologists, public health um, experts all on my side. And what they've found through the last couple of decades of research are a few things. First of all, we actually can measure happiness because people who say they're happy have more activity in the pleasure center of their brain and uh, their blood chemistry is different. So the best way to figure out if some people are happy or not is just to ask them, how happy are you? So that's one thing. The other thing is they've discovered that, yeah, Aristotle was right. So people who say they're happy get sick less often. They check themselves into psych wards less frequently. They kill themselves less frequently. They are more productive at work. This is very good for the economy. Um, it goes on and on. Oh, yeah, and they're happy, too, which is a nice thing. And it's an especially nice thing, actually, because when people say they're happy, they're actually reflecting on their entire life conditions. So policymakers should pay attention to this, because we're deciding what to do and how to vote on the next policy based on our thoughts about whether that'll make us happy or not. So these ideas are important. But then the question is, well, what are the ingredients of happiness? And I know your happiness and my happiness are distinct. 
So I want to be speaking on a more general level. And if you put ideas together and, re- and findings together from all these disciplines, which I just mentioned, you start to get um, a general recipe of societal happiness. So in societies where people say certain conditions are in place, people tend to be happier. And what are those conditions? Well, it's really important to feel more pleasure than pain. That seems fairly obvious, doesn't it? We've thought that ever since the Enlightenment. It's good to, it's good to feel healthy. And actually, feeling healthy is even more important than being healthy. It's good to feel safe and secure. It's good to feel a sense of, a sense of mastery, like you're in control of your life, like this, your life in the city isn't beating you down. Good to have a sense of meaning. Income is important, but in our society, mostly as a matter of status. And all these are tied together by, I was just thinking, one ring shall rule them all. In this case, the ring that rules them all is social connections. So there is no more powerful ingredient to human happiness than strong social connections. So the happy city is a social city. Now, how does this play out? Well, John Halliwell, everyone's favorite happiness economist at UBC, who also advises the UN on happiness, did some surveys of Canadian cities. And he found this really strong correlation between social trust, how much do you trust your neighbors, and people's evaluations of their own happiness. Now, I don't know if you're noticing what I noticed on this graph, but Canada's richest, highest status cities, down at the bottom. Which isn't to say they're totally unhappy, but it is to say that social connections actually outweigh income in their power to influence our well-being. So we need to remember that. A few other things about social connections. People who are socially connected sleep better. They're more productive. They check themselves into psych wards. Less. It's exactly the same list as I would have given you for people who are happy. In other words, social connections are so powerful for our own well-being and the well-being of our cities. They help us be more resilient in hard times as well. But one other thing. People like to think of these happy talks as you know, some great hug fest, and it's all about you know, being friendly to your neighbor, and you know, chicken soup, etc. But social trust that comes through building these relationships is essential for building strong, resilient economies. So trusting companies, sorry, trusting countries are wealthier. Now, in recent years, geographers have begun to chart the effect of social relationships uh, on happiness in cities, and they've found that you can actually predict GDP in a city and creativity measured by, say, patent applications by the degree to which a city allows people to meet face-to-face. The more you have those connections, the richer and more creative the city will be. Okay? So, my argument in the book is that our cities actually can design our social worlds for us without us even knowing it. And I've, you know, I found this quite a shock and quite disappointing because I like to believe in my own agency. So let me give you some examples of, of the things that shocked me. And I always start with, uh, yeah, this, guy, this, this is a message for me, actually. I like to get this graph out of the way. So let me try. Um, let's say you and I want to have a coffee or a cookie after work. And we have an hour and a half window to do so. I need to meet you across time. I need to find that time to meet you. You need to find the time to meet me. But we're also moving across space. So we're living in this three-dimensional space-time continuum. Now, uh, geographers have kind of charted this across American cities. They punched in data for millions and millions of Americans in all the biggest cities. What is the potential for any two people in any one of these cities to meet up. Well, their space-time prisms need to... <laughs> you with me here? Their space-time prisms need to intersect. Um, and what they found, quite maybe uh, obviously, is that the more spread out cities are, the more dispersed cities are, the harder it is for people to connect. In fact, it was the most important factor in determining connections. The second most important was the transportation network. So at a city like Beijing, which is very, very dense, actually still operates like a village because the transportation is so bad, people can't connect. So the city is doing that to us. The sad news, which I found both in the empirical research and in my own travels through the exurbs of the United States, is that uh, our potential future, the future I, I don't want for us, which the Americans already have, is a future of such extreme dispersal 
that leaves people on the edge of their urban agglomerations, people in the exurbs, people who live in the most car-dependent communities uh, with the weakest social relationships of all. So in the U.S., if you live on the edge of, uh, of dispersal, I won't call it sprawl, you are the least likely to trust your neighbors. You're the least likely to have dinner with your family. You're the least likely to do favors for neighbors. You're the least likely to volunteer, to vote. It goes on and on. What happens in these environments is that dispersal has stolen people's time and therefore corroded their social relationships. It's a very sad thing. So we know, for example, that if you have a commute in the States that, uh, actually, this is a Swedish study, people who commute more than 45 minutes actually are 40% more likely to be divorced after 10 years. This plays out all through. And we do know that the best thing you can do for your own happiness in, shit, in, in, in shitty cities is to, <laughs> excuse me, is to shorten your commute. So this is essential. This plays out across the world. Across the, world. the longer your commute, the lower uh, life satisfaction is. Okay, so that's one element. So we, we see that cities influence our, our social landscape. I also want to talk uh, about a few other elements about how cities, and, and moving in particular, influence our well-being. Okay, just to round out um, our, our, our transit portion of the evening. So how we move is how we feel. Here's a graph from the Netherlands. And people were surveyed on the emotions they felt moving throughout the city. What we're getting here is people who move by their own power, on foot or by bike, feel more joy and less fear, rage and sadness than people in all other modes. Okay? So, if you walk, if you bike in an environment that's conducive to it, within five minutes, you get an immediate uh, hormonal response, you feel cheerier, you feel more optimistic, and oddly enough, um, your food tastes better. Uh, I like to eat and walk myself. So, um, and yes, that's Disneyland on the left. Uh, so the second best way to move around cities for your own personal happiness is to drive a cool car. And a cool car is really important. Again, there's an immediate uh, hormonal response, especially with young males. Um, uh, drive a car on an open road. Which, I mean, who can deny the freedom and the wonderful sense of mastery you feel? The problem is, um, and this is... <laughs> this is is anybody here from the Vancouver Sun? No, I'm sorry, I didn't ask permission for this photo. Uh, the problem is, is that once we get into congested cities, and I felt this in Langley, and I felt this in downtown Vancouver, the experience of driving changes. In fact, studies in the UK suggest that um, driving in traffic has the same stress response as um, piloting a fighter jet. Now, people, people's ideal driving commutes are always, uh, they suggest in, the, in California, are 16 minutes, but almost nobody has that length of a drive. Now, the story that accompanied this image in the Vancouver Sun was one that suggested that people experience more incivility, more rudeness when driving than in any other mode of transportation, even more than on transit. So it's something we should bear in mind. Okay, uh, third on the list, last on the list, um, people in public transportation rate their experience universally lower than people in other modes. Now, there are many reasons for this. We all may have our own reasons for this. It doesn't have to be this way. Um, I'm going to touch on uh, why transit is not as happy as it could be and how it could be happier further in the program. But a couple of key elements are here is a loss of control and long journeys. The transit journey is almost always longer than everybody else's. And as we know, it doesn't have to be. Okay, so... From all that data, what kind of surprised me is that here in the Lower Mainland, four in every ten trips is actually less than, um, less than eight kilometers. So you could do that in a 20-minute 20, 20 bike ride. And one in every five trips is less than two kilometers, which is like a really short walk, 20, 20 24 minutes. That would make you happy. Or an eight-minute bike ride. And yet almost nobody travels this way. Helena, I know you said, you know, even, um, even in um, uh, south of the Fraser, people walk and bike more than in other communities. But the truth is, something like only 2% of trips in the Lower Mainland are done by bike, and only 1 in 10 are done by walking. So I find this uh, fascinating, actually. So what is behind this? <laughs> actually, it's a rhetorical question, because I have the answer. <laughs> our cities design our behavior and our bodies. Um, 
we know from work done in various jurisdictions that if you create, well, I should say, looking on the left, if you don't bother creating infrastructure for cycling, for example, this is a picture from Halifax where they have like three, uh, three blocks of separated bike lanes in their city and they're not even connected to each other. Um, so if you do that, you leave the cycling to the kamikazes, the 60% of people who actually want to cycle but find it too scary or uncomfortable just won't join you. And if you build the infrastructure, well, hello, Copenhagen, 33% mode share. It's actually really simple. Um, and that's a double wide lane now in Copenhagen so people can chat on their way to work. Uh, we also know that uh, our immediate environment influences the way we feel moving around the city. So on the top landscape, people will walk 800 meters just to go shopping. Think nothing of it. Cities, uh, I, this it comes from Montreal, New York, also in Vancouver. 800 meters is quite a ways. Um, in the bottom environment, in a big box environment, uh, people won't even walk 200 meters. They won't even walk between stores. So we've all had that experience. You drive to uh, Costco, you load up the buggy, you take it to the car, and you think, oh, no, 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 no. And you drive over to the next big box. It's a natural reaction to a harsh unforgiving, unfriendly, and unsafe place. Now, many of you know of uh, Larry Frank's terrific work looking at health and cities. Larry Frank is now at UBC. But he did some really neat work uh, looking at Atlanta, the capital of uh, sprawl on the east coast of the United States. <clears throat> I meant not to use that word, sprawl. Um, and so inspired by Larry's work, I actually spent some time in Atlanta, and my team and I uh, put together a couple of maps. Um, we made a map out in uh, Mableton, which is a part of the um, suburban loop around Atlanta, and in Midtown, which is an old uh, connected grid-shaped community. So out in, in Mableton, where will the 10-minute walk get you? I don't know if you can read the details on this map, but um, nowhere. <laughs> There's n not a store, not a church. Uh, there is a church just beyond the 10-minute the, the walk. Um, it, over in Midtown, you literally have dozens of options. Stores, bars, restaurants, uh, a great park, public bathrooms, transit. It goes on and on and on. And what Larry found was that the same person living in Mableton will weigh 10 pounds more because the city has designed that behavior. Um, additional evidence in Charlotte, North Carolina, a year after putting in a great light ra rail line, people in the neighboring neighborhoods... Uh, nearby, uh, lost an average of seven pounds. Nobody forced them onto the light rail. They just decided it was much more fun and easy, so they started walking there. So how can we intervene to change the city to affect the way people move and essentially to give them more freedom? Well, actually, even before addressing that, I want to pause and, and, and encourage you all to consider what I think to be the most tricky issue facing well-being in cities, and that's that issue of status, of equity. Our cities are terribly unfair, and we know that feeling low in status is terrible for your health. Right, Helena? Terrible. Um, you get sick more, you die younger. And this is not just a matter of income, and it's not, and it's actually, uh, it exists even in regimes that have great health care. So, does anybody remember this awful GM ad that ran in the Georgia Strait? <laughs> It was shocking. So I ride the number 20 to East Van every day, and this ad is reminding me that I am a creep and a weirdo among creeps and weirdos. And I don't want to editorialize uh, about the number 20, although TransLink has found that it, uh, it is the route with the least, least user satisfaction. Um, but that's not my point. The point is, as a society, we're treating, we're treating public transit as a handout to the undeserving, which is a real shame. So is there another way to look at this? Well, there's no way to go through this conversation without um, uh, introducing you know, the evangelist of the happy city himself, Enrique Peñalosa. And have any of you heard Enrique talk? So if you didn't start crying, you have no heart. He just has that way to talk about uh, the sacredness of every individual in the city. So I went down to Bogota to, to ride around with Enrique without getting into the story too deeply, because I know many of you have heard his story. Whoops. Um, what he did was redesign the city in his three-year term of, uh, as mayor in order to maximize happiness. Now, his happiness program was all about equity. It wasn't evidence-based. But putting that aside, 
he canceled the $6 billion freeway plan. Sorry, I just got an image of Kevin Falcon in my head for a second. Um, that section's coming. <laughs> sorry. This is not a political discussion. Um, he, uh, sorry, he canceled the $6 billion freeway plan, and he uh, invested instead in parks, daycares, schools, uh, uh, great bike routes, uh, and it went on and on. So the education rate went up, health rates went up. Um, but the intervention that I was really interested in was a status intervention. So he created a rapid bus system based on the, uh, the model um, of, um, help me, Brazil? Thank you. Everybody knows this story. <laughs> okay, well, we'll zoom quickly through it. So as you can see, the Trans Millennia, with its sexy name, its lipstick red buses, it took all the best road space away from cars and gave it to the people willing to share space. I love the stations. They're airport chic. Now, he did this again. This is a status intervention. And what I found remarkable in Bogota is that not only can a poor person cross the city just as, as quickly as their boss in the BMW, but now, I shouldn't say now, things have gone downhill in Bogota in the last, uh, in the last 10 years, but after his interventions, everybody was moving faster because more people were voluntarily taking the fast, sexy bus. So we can learn from this. Now onto freedom. As I mentioned at the beginning, one of the key elements of human happiness is to move through our days with a sense of mastery, not to feel helpless, not to feel like a victim of the city. I did some tests with the Guggenheim Museum on a little run there in, in New York City. Uh, tests on design, public space, urban experience. And one thing we did during a party was we built a, 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 a subway car out of fabric. And once people had drank enough, we invited them into our subway car. <laughs> and... Um, they thought that was cool and fun, and it was very spacious. But then we started to squeeze them together. And although those people are smiling, um, by the end of the exercise, they weren't really so happy. And what, what we were doing to them is we were testing their level of arousal. These are skin conductance cuffs, which we latched onto people's wrists. And what these cuffs do is, tell you, uh, is give a reading on uh, your level of arousal, not sexual arousal. Um, <laughs> But uh, arousal is sort of value neutral. But it, as we all know, when we lose the ability to control our relationships or proximity with other people or with our environment, it's very, very stressful. Thanks, Alina. So this idea of re reducing stress moving through cities I, is really important. And it's related to that question of status. So I don't know if anybody has been to Paris recently. And I can't speak French. What do they call it? Liberté? Uh, this notion of freedom. And I really felt that in Paris. I have a friend named Eric Britton in Paris who loves to show the city off. And the first thing he shows you is not the city at all. It's this wonderful purple card called the Navigo card. And the Navigo card gets you... Actually, I tried, to, I tried to download the map of what it got you. It's impossible. It gets you too many things. It gets you on the metro. It gets you on the rapid buses. It gets you on the bus network. Um, it gets you on the Velib, the shared bikes. It gets you on a, sh a car share network. And there's probably some other things it gets you, like uh, cookies. And <laughs> it, it's just an amazing thing. So moving around Eric's neighborhood, you couldn't go half a block from his house without having another transportation option. And one of the originators of this transportation system was the leader of their Green Party. So I met up with him, and I was terrified that he was going to go on and on and on about saving the polar bears, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, in his crisp linen suit, he said, this is about lifestyle. And I said, what do you mean? He said, we want to give people the freedom to live with less stuff. And I said, well, where I come from, that, that's called being poor. And he said, no, <laughs> no. He said, just imagine moving seamlessly, floating through the city, not worrying about a car, not worrying about your bike, drifting from mode to mode without a care in the world. You flash your car, you keep moving. And we know in central Paris that's true because the net, transit networks are so frequent and the stations for the Velives and the car shares are so close together. Unfortunately, we also know that that system only works in the central city. I don't know if you watched the news a couple of weeks ago about the pollution crisis in Paris. They tried to ban driving for a couple of days. It didn't go over because people out in the suburbs beyond the peripherique are stranded without their cars. They don't have that freedom. So I think... Looking back at our own region, we need to be very, very careful how we're designing our cities, not just the transportation network. And yes, the province has gone and sold 
another huge swath of Burke Mountain. And my rudimentary understanding of, of transit planning tells me that the people who live in these neighborhoods are not going to get the freedom of shared vehicles or a frequent transit access. Your kids are going to be stranded. Sorry, Greg is not here today. Okay, good. Um, so this is something we need to be careful of. And I just wanted to give one little shout out to TransLink. Fortunately, we have this tremendous agency in this region, which is actually working with municipalities in the central city and in the suburbs to build connected, high-status, transit-oriented, walkable environments to give people this great sense of freedom. Um, this is a plan for, I think, Langley, Langley Center or Willowbrook Mall. And if you happen to live near here, or if you move near this place in the future, you can save your family $10,000 a year. Because we know that people in central connected Vancouver own one fewer car per family than people who live in less connected environments. So it's about creating that freedom. Um, back to this notion of our false choice uh, in terms of which residence we would lived in. So I mentioned to you at the beginning of this talk something that's actually a huge downer uh, and that has been brought to life by the behavioral economists and the great Daniel Kahneman, the only psychologist ever to win the Nobel uh, Prize for economics, actually. Now, in his years of work and in his tremendous book, which I encourage you to buy after you've bought mine, uh, <laughs> Kahneman talks about these shortcuts all of us have learned to make in making decisions because, you know, for example, walking across the stage, I really can't think about where to put my feet because then I just start to fumble over my words and everything else I need to think about. So we automatically have behaviors and um, mechanisms to not worry about what we're deciding. He calls these, calls these heuristics. But they also translate into terrible and predictable cognitive errors in our complex society and complex cities. A, a couple of examples. <clears throat> we all know that... Uh, a burning house or a terrible emergency is worth paying attention to. And in fact, our mind does pay attention to them, even when the emergency is not happening. So our visceral fear of salient danger, like a house fire, has caused us to design our roads wide enough for fire trucks, which seems like a very sensible thing to do, until you realize now that those roads are also designing high-speed drivers or high-speed driving behavior. So particularly in newer neighborhoods, people are driving faster, roads are less safe. If you live in suburban America, and I think this is also true in Canada, you're more likely to be killed by a stranger than people living downtown. It's just that those strangers happen to be driving cars. We also know that people aren't letting their kids play on the streets anymore because the streets aren't safe enough. Again, back to public health and Helena's message. Uh, because inactive kids are kids who are going to die younger. So that's one issue. Um, the other one is uh, this tendency we have as a species, and necessary, to simplify complex problems. It doesn't always translate so well into city building. So in Dubai, they thought, hey, you know, a city's kind of like a tree. Why don't we build a new city in the shape of a palm tree out in the ocean? And the world's rich, some of them bought there. And aside from financial issues, what we know now is that if you build a dendritic road system and have it all coming down the trunk to the shore, you've built yourself the world's worst traffic jam. <laughs> and it's really easy to laugh at people on the other side of the world when we're making the same mistakes here. I don't want to point any fingers. No, don't, don't, this, we're going to be nice today. But, you know, a few years ago, I did, I did take a a ride on, on my friend Kevin Falcon's commute with him in his forerunner, I believe it was, in from Langley. And we were stuck in traffic. It was awful. And we both had the same reaction to this problem. This traffic is brutal. We need more roads. And I agreed with him completely. <clears throat> so Kevin went and invested $3 billion in a new bridge and highway system. And it's only in the last couple of years, as we look at what's happening on the Port Brand Bridge, that we're realizing, oh, it's actually a complex system. Maybe all he needed to do was toll the old bridge and add a rapid bus across it, and we wouldn't have had to make that investment. So again, complex systems. We're not so good at figuring these things out unless we really slow down. Does anybody know about this experiment, very cruel experiment conducted on children? <laughs> so what they do is they put an Oreo in front of a child in a blank room. 
And they say to the child, you can have that Oreo. Or if you wait five minutes, I'll give you two Oreos. And then they, the experimenter leaves the room and they leave the poor kid there. Now, what they found is that kids who don't eat the Oreo, who wait for the second Oreo, perform better later in school and they have much better lives. These are longitudinal studies, amazingly. <laughs> Which is really bad news for all of you who are laughing because I know you're like me. You're an Oreo eater. <laughs> but the truth is we're kind of hardwired to be these Oreo eaters when we don't slow down and use our slow brain and we don't consider the complexity of problems. So, I don't know, a few examples. Uh, sell off a bunch of crown land now to pay off your debts rather than saving for the future. Um, how about uh, loosening your um, land reserve restrictions and not preserving your farmland? That might be one, uh, you know, because it's good to have development right now. How about not making the difficult decisions to raise taxes in order to pay for the systems we're going to need in the future? Th these, these issues are not just happening in here in Vancouver. They're happening in cities all over the world. And we're challenged to slow down and use our slow brain. So our challenge here is very particular. Let's just jump into it. By 2041, we've got more than a million new people coming to the region, 600,000 more jobs. So what does that look like? Fortunately, there's smarter people than me out there. One of them is Matt Taylor. I don't think he's here tonight. But Matt uh, is an analyst who did this great work uh, crunching the numbers. So if you have all these people and jobs coming, and you don't have investment in uh, robust new transit uh, infrastructure, we're likely to have 730,000 more vehicles on the roads if we behave like other cities. That would require a 26-lane freeway to handle those vehicles. You'd also need... <laughs> you'd also need 22 million uh, new parking spots. That's imagining every vehicle needs two, three parking spots. Amazingly, in Canada, I think we have six parking spots for every vehicle. So these are humble numbers. And that, that adds up to 66 square kilometers, or most of Richmond. So this is where we're heading. It's kind of scary. <clears throat> um, but that's not the end of it. And I don't think I'm surprising anyone here. But it needs to be said, our future without these tremendous investments, and yes, probably road pricing, is going to look very difficult. Not just for people on bikes, but for people who are stuck in the region with very little freedom. Even today, we're looking at uh, the cost of congestion being something like uh, 1.5 billion cost to the economy uh, through um, health costs and uh, lost economic opportunities. Costs to families, again, families being forced to have two or more vehicles just to get around. Uh, people ferrying their kids around in minivans when they could easily have walked if they lived in a connected city. <clears throat> and it goes on and on. The worst of all these concerns that I have anyway is the fact that we will be designing disconnection, social disconnection into our future. And it doesn't have to be that way. So back to Daniel Kahneman. How can we move to slow brain thinking? How can we stop basing our plans on fear-based, impulsive thinking? Well, we've done it before, actually. Back in the 1970s, we got together and created the Livable City Plan. We got everybody into various rooms. I don't know why I wasn't there. I was just a kid then. But, Gord, I imagine you were there. And the <laughs> <laughs> but you were there. I, that's not an insult. But my point is, we've done it before. We can pull the forces together in a room. We can compromise. So the question is, where is our vision now? Particularly, where is our vision around how to move around the, uh, around the region? I have to say that the staff at TransLink is not able to share their future projections with me because I, I think you're all just too scared of the political fallout because TransLink has been kicked around for too long. We know that our, our, our mayors are now locking themselves in a room once every week to come up with a vision within the next month, which I find amazing. But what might that future vision look like? Somebody's got to come out and say it. Fortunately, a couple of guys with nothing to lose, uh, Paul Hilsden and Nathan Pachel last summer, just said, you know what, screw it. We're just going to make a vision and put it out there. So they called it Leap Ahead. I'm going to run through their vision, what they suggested we need. So there's your basic rapid transit uh, infrastructure in the lower mainland right now. Uh, the blue, the dark blue, are these areas of jobs and population concentration. 
of course, Broadway, Subway. And again, we can talk about this in the bar afterwards, but I've seen the numbers, and I don't want to wait any longer at Commercial Drive. Um, anyway, they've argued it out very thoroughly. Um, but let's just give everyone what they want. Of course, Surrey Light Rail both as a means of getting people around as a, and as a means of building more connected uh, community centers and right out to the Langleys. Of course, a network of rapid buses to link it all together. Of course, that awesome um, gondola to SFU. <laughs> Not only is it cool, but it, there's actually a very good business case for it, but there's also a powerful well-being case for it, as anybody who goes to SFU and has been stuck on a bus in winter in the snow knows. And then, of course, uh, improvements to the expo line to handle all these extra people who are coming. What they didn't add, and I think they should have, was, um, of course, robust improvements to our frequent transit network throughout the region. But let's forgive them that for a moment. What I thought was very cool is they costed this out. And if you follow the formula uh, that has traditionally been followed with municipalities and federal governments in Canada, we pay a third in the region. That means $6.5 billion. How do you pay for it? 0.5% uh, sales tax. The best way to think of that is five pennies on every $10 for this amazing, robust network. So that's just a start. <sighs> so I don't know if this makes you very, very sad, but it does me, and it, perhaps for different reasons. We can vision all we want, but unfortunately, as a region, we've been put in the position um, of being faced with a referendum. And in my research with the psychologists and talking to people in other cities, referendums generally don't succeed. And I'll give you one example of why, um, why often they don't. It's a local example, actually. Uh, the Leisure Marketing Group, or the polling group, polled Canadian commuters but also commuters in Vancouver, about their driving habits and their aspirations for the future. Drivers wanted, they, they saw their commute getting much worse in the future without uh, serious investment. <clears throat> they said they'd switch to transit if it was good. They said it's fair for drivers to pay the costs of improvements on roads. They said um, tolling was probably a good idea. Uh, they also said no way would they agree on road tolling and no way would they agree if those, if those revenues went to a transit network, which would be exactly the thing that would save them. So again, this is fast brain thinking. This is what referendum thinking does to us. So the best thing we could do is to cancel the referendum, but it's not going to happen, is it? So how are we going to save ourselves? I want to put us past this little moment of sadness and in my last five minutes move to a sunnier narrative, and I was thinking, how can we take lessons from psychology and behavioral economics, from happiness studies, and apply them to this very difficult challenge we have ahead, if the referendum is coming, if there's nothing we can do about it? And it actually hit me when I had a good long conversation with a guy named Roger Sherman, who's a public relations expert, who's based in Denver. Now, Roger Sherman happens to be the PR guy who helped w Denver win its own transit referendum. So anybody who knows about these issues knows that Denver failed in 1999, and then they tried again in 2004, and they won, amazingly. And <clears throat> uh, Roger's advice to me was just the same kind of advice that the behavioral economists have been giving. So he took me through their plan. Uh, they called it Fast Tracks. First of all, they gave it a really cool name. Um, he said, first of all, well, I'm paraphrasing now, address the fast brain and the slow brain. So you need to create a very, very clear plan. It needs to be fully costed out, fully detailed. Give people all the information and no room for speculation as to what this might be. He said, appeal to people's core values. And I see a couple of people in the room who spent their lives doing very important work on environmental issues, and these are important, and I support your cause. But if we talk about the polar bears and sinking Bangladesh as a part of this referendum question, we're not going to win. We're going to win if we address the core audience. 85% of the people move through this region in cars. They need to understand how transit and infrastructural improvements will improve their everyday life. 
That was his most powerful piece of advice. He also said, create a, very, a visceral, again, back to that notion of, of how salience affects us, create a visceral sense of the two options. Own both options. So paint a very clear picture of that miserable future, which I think I've tried to do earlier tonight, that you, we will certainly experience if we don't make investments. And then paint a very clear picture of the future with more freedom, more good health, more options, faster roads, um, and more sunshine, <laughs> amazingly. It's really great. Um, um, he also gave me uh, two more pieces of, pieces of advice, which is celebrity is really important. We're attracted to success. This movement needs a champion. I'm just racking my brain here. Um, so if not this guy, I was thinking maybe Diane Watts, who seems to be respected on all rounds. The truth is Christy Clark needs to be the champion. So I encourage you political operators, Jeff Meg, to give your hugs to Christy Clark so she can own this operation. She must. <laughs> I, I didn't catch that. But otherwise, Diane Watts. Um, and maybe Brad Pitt's coming to town. Um, the last thing I want to say to you, and I and appreciate your patience during this talk, is to bring this back around to some of the fundamental points on happiness itself. I said early in this talk that the most important ingredient of human happiness is getting together, is working together. Now, this is a lesson from John Halliwell, and I hold it close. I'm not going to ask you to sing the happy song, which he would, but I want to remind you that working together, actually even before this, back to Roger's comments, he said you need a robust coalition and everybody must be on board. So you need business. Certainly our real estate community has got to buck up because these campaigns, Roger tells me, cost at least $3 million to fund. You need the environmental community. Did I say students? You need students. You need politicians at all levels. You need Bob Rennie. Uh, Brad Pitt, we all need to be in the room. His point is well taken. Back to the point I was trying to make, which is that if we do this work together, if we reach out to people who we may not, disagree, we may not agree with, if we make compromises, if we embrace this shared vision of a future together, it's actually very good for us as individuals. So this process, looking out forward to this referendum choice, which hopefully can be delayed at least to 2016, is an opportunity for us to build more resilient communities in our own lives as well. So on that note, I would like to invite you, first of all, to hang out and uh, chat a little bit here afterwards. Uh, we can answer some questions and have some discussion. But more importantly, um, I think there's some room for us over at the Charles Bar afterwards, and we're going to drink some beer and talk about strategy. And I invite everybody to come, because I'm not your leader, but I'm sure our leader is somewhere in this room. Brad Pitt, where are you? Thanks for, um, for being here today, and thanks for joining me in this journey. <laughs>